Hello, everyone. Welcome back to EC 20002. I feel a lot more rested than I did yesterday, so I'm eager to talk about more topics and uh, filtering and then start our last lecture set, lecture set H, on circuit elements at high frequency. Uh, one thing I'm sure people are eager to figure out is how do the exams look? Right now we have 72 uh, exams graded out of 119 or so. I think there were like 116 or 119 such submissions of exams. Uh, so obviously there's still a lot of work to go. However, so far uh, the average has been a 55.83. The median has been uh, roughly 55, uh, slightly, uh, slightly more than that. And then uh, mode so far is running about a 56. So um, clearly these numbers will change as uh, we get more exams graded, but that's kind of what we have so far. The standard deviation is a Fairly wide, 18.04, uh, which is pretty wide for this, uh, this few exams graded relative to the num total number of exams. So, uh, you know, very, you know, performance has been variable. Um, you know, I, I've seen grades in the teens and I have seen grades in the 90s. So it's been... Uh, quite a journey grading these. Uh, you never know what you're going to see. <laughs> Any more questions about the exam? No, Riyadh, yours is not graded. Do you think you're, you're going to boost the average and bring up everyone's statistics? Hopefully. I, I hope that for everyone we haven't graded yet, but that's not a very likely scenario that everyone would do better than the average. Number two was a hard problem. There's a reason I said save it for last. I don't think I've seen a perfect score on homework on problem two yet. Uh, it was hard. There, the, the trick was pretty hard on that one. Uh, but, you know, I think we're on track to have everything graded by Friday. Uh, we'll release the solution then and uh, have grades posted hopefully by Friday. Uh, any questions about anything in the course? No questions? Let's go ahead and uh, have a quick reminder that quiz five will be due, uh, you know, between Friday and Saturday. So this will be the last quiz. Uh, similarly, homework seven has been posted. Homework seven due on Monday. That's not going to get pushed back. If anything, I'll have to remove problems, but I'll, I'm going to do my best to get through all the material. Um, but homework seven due on Monday as well. Um, we, we are on track to cover everything, unless, of course, you have, you know, good discussions, in which case we may not cover everything. Yeah, the final exam does start a week from today. I do need to make the final equation sheet for this class. Um, so that, that did remind me of that. All right, let's get started. So we've been talking about Butterworth filters and how we build them using both passive components and active components. So as a review, let's talk a little bit about active low pass filters. So, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, we talked about how, you know, by some clever manipulation uh, of the poles and zeros uh, uh, of a transfer function, we can get a form that looks like, you know, the cascaded inverting op amp circuits where it's just one inverting op amp after another. So, you know, if we have an input impedance Z and an uh, output impedance or feedback impedance ZF, you know, we would get, you know, H of S is negative ZF over Z in. 
which in terms of admittances is negative y in over yf. And the reason why we want to think of admittances is because we want to avoid dealing with capacitors and admittances in parallel add directly. So we can just think of it as a capacitance and a conductance or one over a resistance. So by you know doing something like this, where we say, okay, yn has to be the four, uh, four Siemens and yf has to be s plus six Siemens, we interpret the input admittance as the conductance of four S, uh, thus a resistance of a quarter ohm. Uh, the feedback admittance is a parallel combination of a capacitance of one farad and a resistance of one sixth of an ohm. Then we magnitude scale to make things more practical. And since uh, we are dealing with a voltage to voltage type transfer function, we can just you know, scale each of our stages independently. And we got something that looked like this where you know the capacitor helps works in concert with the resistance and the feedback loop to produce a pole. And of course, we just have our input gain right there. Negative, of course, because it's an inverting op amp configuration. Then we can keep factoring out terms and get easily implementable parts doing the same thing and doing the same or doing whatever magnitude scaling we please. And we can get a two-stage op amp to do two real poles and a real zero. Complex poles are a little bit more complicated, so we need a amplifier configuration. We don't prove that the uh, uh, Salen key topology filter uh, produces, you know, the nice, you know, quadratic, irreducible quadratic in the denominator. However, you can work your way through the math uh, once you know the configuration to work it out. So this has a gain that's greater than one. If you want a gain uh, uh, of exactly one, you can do this much simpler form without resistors RA and RB, which is what we're going to use most of the time. So we'll get you know, an input resistance R1 to point B, a resistance R2 to point A at the non-inverting terminal. And also at point A, we'll have a capacitance C2 to ground. We'll have a direct negative feedback path between the output of U1 and the inverting terminal. And then from the uh, output of U1 to point B, we also have C1. So it's important that you, you know, know where each of these resistors or where each of these capacitors are located because they serve very different roles. And hence why C1 appears uh, in a special place where C2 doesn't appear in the linear term of the denominator. So you can implement the various stages. We chose one, an example where conveniently the numbers were already worked out stages. And then we have this form right here where we can equate the Salen key filter topology transfer function to, uh, you know, various, uh, you know, coefficients in the transfer function we want to implement for H3 of S. So we'll get one over R1, R2, C1, C2 equals 25 seconds squared. And what over C1 par parallel R1, R2 is uh, six seconds. You choose two resistance values. So now that we have four equations and four unknowns, we can solve for the remaining two values of C1 and C2. And we magnitude scale again. And then the order is not important because uh, you know these filters cascade you, you know, such that it's just multiplication and multiplication is commutative. And of course, we got this nice, wonderful course motivation circuit that we saw way back in lecture set one. But now we can understand how we got here a little bit better, especially now that we have transfer functions, Laplace, you know, basic knowledge of how the capacitor works, how amplifiers work, and have practiced our circuit knowledge a little bit more. What's the difference? Ideally, they're the same thing. You know, they have different things. You know, we're getting rid of inductors, AJ. So these are, you can, these are also Butterworth filters. Um, well, okay, I guess these aren't necessarily Butterworth filters, but you can do the Butterworth design process uh, the exact same way. And uh, an active filter will allow you to have, you know, a gain greater than one overall in absolute value.
Now, if we actually see how we're going to design active high pass filters, uh, we have the slide number 45, first new slide of the day. So just as with the Cower topology for passive high pass filters, we will use duality to design a normalized low pass filter as part of the Sal and Key topology high pass filter design process. So, so here's our design process. We're going to convert the high pass filter design problem to a low pass filter design problem. We'll go through all the transfer function design steps as before, you know, where we choose the correct Butterworth polynomial, we equate terms, uh, you know, and then we to of our Butterworth polynomial transfer function to that with our uh, actual circuit topology. So we'll implement the circuit topology as a normalized low pass filter. We'll frequency scale by capital omega C, the normalized cutoff frequency. Uh, we'll convert circuit elements and magnitude scale as necessary. So we already know how to do, you know, the Butterworth polynomials, how to, uh, you know, get omega C. We already know how to, you know, choose a topology you know, because now we know how to implement real poles and complex poles. Now the real question is, you know, how do we, uh, you know, set up the problem? And then how do we convert the circuit elements at the end? Because now we have resistors and capacitors instead of uh, with a lot with our op amps instead of just inductors and capacitors. So here's how we're going to do it. So we'll take the simplest example we can which is a normalized low pass filter that implements the first order Butterworth uh, transfer function one over S plus one. And we're gonna neglect the negative side. We would get a negative side if we're implementing this actively. It doesn't change the component values. It just is an overall gain of negative one. If we don't like the overall gain of negative one, just slap an inverting amplifier as our sort of zero stage in there so, uh, with RN equals uh, RF, and that will take care of the negative side and get you back to a positive sign. work this out, you will get uh, that the first order low pass filter was going to have one over Rn over S times Cf plus one over Rf, um, where this is just, you know, using admittances to do the math. We can generalize inversion of the frequency axis, you know, capital omega is equal to omega C divided by omega to complex frequency values. So, you know, we can work not just with omegas, but with S as values as well and say S is equal to omega C divided by S, or S maps to omega C divided by S, or S is for the high pass filter. Or if you don't like thinking in this way, you could say uh, S for the high pass filter, S, you know, S sub H times S for the low pass filter, S sub L equals omega C, another geometric mean type relationship. And the normalized case will take the cutoff frequency to be one radian per second. So we'll get our normalized high pass filter is equal to our normalized low pass filter just with S replaced with omega C divided by S. So we'll get one over RN and then we'll get omega C divided by S times omega CF plus one over RF. Multiply through by S, we'll get S over RN divided by CF plus S over RF. So, you know, we don't like leaving S in the denominator of a denominator, you know, complex fractions, you know, we avoid them when possible, unless they are necessary for our coefficients. And then, you know, S has basically changed hands. S went from being associated with the capacitance terms to now being associated with all the resistance terms. That's a key point. So our high pass filter, you know, S is no longer associated with capacitive terms, it's associated with resistive terms. So the desired high pass filter has the frequency dependence relationship swapped from the low pass filter design. Yes, it does. Capacitors and resistors have switched roles when converting a normalized low pass filter to a normalized high pass filter. So here we go. Let's read this. The old normalized low pass filter resistance became a new normalized high pass filter capacitance with a value of one over the resistance. And the old normalized low pass filter capacitance became a new normalized high pass filter resistance with a value of what over the old capacitance. Well, that's great. We have normalized circuits, but you know, we're going to frequency scale because we want to deal with, you know, filters most likely that aren't at one radian per second cut off. So we have to understand, you know, how to build a useful filter now. 
So here we go. So the non-normalized high pass filter will have S over RN over omega C CF plus S over RF. We can uh, divide through by omega C and we'll get S divided by omega C RN uh, over CF plus S over omega C RF. So these terms behave like capacitances and this term behaves like a conductance. So when omega C is not one radian per second, the pole of the normalized first order low pass filter at S equals negative one over RFCF needs to move to S equals plus, minus RFCF. So it moves to its reciprocal for the high pass filter under frequency inversion. So this is just an observation and we're going to take this observation and generalize it you know, to all orders of filters. So we also multiplied the old capacitances by the original uh, omega C used to define the normalized frequency in the first place. And then finally, we can apply any magnitude scaling with KM as needed to match a reference resistance or to make realistic component values. So uh, how we were going to read this. So our old normalized resistance in our low pass filter in the, or our old resistance in our normalized low pass filter becomes a capacitance in our new high pass filter with the value of one over the old resistance. The capacitance in our old normalized low pass filter becomes a resistance in our non normalized high pass filter with the value of one over omega C times the old capacitance. So that's how we do the element conversion between resistances and capacitances when going from a high pass filter or from a low pass filter to a high pass filter. And that is all of lecture set seven. What questions do we have? You want examples? That's such a silly student thing, wanting examples to actually show you how to work out problems. Uh, I'll do that as part of the exam review. So make a note on Piazza that you would like to see uh, an active filter or you know active low pass or active high pass filter design as part of exam review. Um, it's going to be very similar to what we've already seen, but I'd be willing to work out an example. Uh, not today, as part of our review next week before the final exam, I'll do it. What other questions do we have? I guess it kind of went without saying, but you can always, you, but you can make a fairly inefficient, you know, band pass or band stop filter for even orders, because you can always do a low pass filter followed by a high pass for filter or vice versa, a high pass filter followed by a low pass filter. And that'll basically create a band pass effect or a band stop effect. So, you know, you can basically create everything but an all-pass filter at this point. All-pass filter would be a little tricky. But not out of the ordinary. No more questions? Okay. We start lecture set eight then. The final lecture set available on Brightspace. So circuit elements at high frequency. So this comes from the final three chapters of the Talavich and Turlop textbook 37 through 39. And it'll end our coverage of electrical engineering fundamentals too. So we basically have uh, to re-examine everything we know about our circuit elements and everything we use to build circuits on our breadboard and see how they do, uh, how they hold up at high frequency. So we have our non-ideal elements like the non-ideal resistor, non-ideal inductor, and non-ideal capacitor. 
Uh, so uh, we're going to look at each of them in turn and, and see exactly how we can model them uh, to work towards higher frequencies. And then we're going to do this neat trick called single, fre well, I call it single frequency impedance conversion. I'm sure there's other names for it out there, but it's basically if we want to convert series impedances to parallel impedances, how do we do that? Uh, and we'll learn that you could do it for a single frequency, but you can't do it for you know a range of frequencies. So this is only for dealing with you know circuits being excited with a single frequency. But the next thing that we actually need to re-examine is probably a bit unexpected. Surprisingly, we need to re-examine how wires work. And that's how we get to transmission lines. So we'll do a transmission lines, which are wires in isolation and see how they behave at high frequency, uh, including the lossless and lossy cases and the wave equation will make a nice appearance. And then we'll deal with how transmission lines connect to other components we'll get reflection and transmission as well as input and output impedances. So why study non-ideal components? You know, why, why do this? Uh, some people thought this was an unnecessary part of the curriculum, but I disagree strongly. This keeps coming back in my work again and again and again, uh, in my research life, uh, in, in internships, this keeps coming back. So every electrical component available in the real world, you know, that you could buy exhibits some form of non-ideal behavior. You know, nothing is just a pure resistance of value R and, or a pure capacitance of value C or a pure inductance of value L. There's random such non-idealities where you can't determine whether it's going to be above or below uh, a certain value. So like we have precision. So like, you know, they're manufactured different tolerances. It's not exactly 100 ohms. It might be you know, 100.56 ohms or 99.78 ohms. And then temperature effects, you know, at higher temperatures, you know, it may not be 100 ohms anymore. It's going to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, 106 ohms. And, you know, directly at, you know, room temperature, it may not be 100 ohms. It could be above or below it. So, there are systemic non-idealities that go along with the random ones too. And these are most pronounced at high frequency leading to the designation high frequency effects. So these are things that are always gonna be off about the resistance of a resistor or you know, the capacitance of a capacitor, inductance of an inductor, always gonna be off due to uh, you know, high frequency effects. But thankfully, you know, it's not like, you know, everything we've learned is completely for naught. The passive components we've been examining can be modeled quite well using multiple ideal components. So instead of just saying an inductor is an inductance, you know, we can combine inductances, resistances, and capacitances to get a fairly accurate model for a realistic inductor or the non-ideal inductor. So let's talk about each of these components in turn. So let's talk about the non-ideal resistor. So we got to know a little bit about how each of these components are made. So this is the time to do it. And I don't think it ever gets brought up elsewhere in the curriculum, except maybe in lab, but you know, might as well as use a little bit of lecture time to review these ideas. So the major resistor technologies are carbon film, thick ceramic or surmet film, where surmet is ceramic metal in close contact. You know, it's a basically ceramic metal alloy. So we've got thick ceramic or surmet films. We've got thin ceramic surmet films. We've got metal films and wire wound capacitors. So if you were to actually open up the sort of barbell shaped uh, body of a resistor, you would see that it's just a piece of the film I, you know, in the carbon case, you know, just a piece of carbon film wrapped around the center column of plastic uh, with, you know, as many turns as needed to cr create a long enough length to get the desired resistance. So this helical cut of resistive material should remind you a little bit of an inductor with some amount of inner turn capacitance. So already we're gonna expect, you know, to see an inductor and because we have, you know, one turn of coil 
uh, separated from another turn of coil. That looks like, you know, basically metal over metal or ceramic uh, over ceramic. Looks a little bit like a capacitor stretching across the length of the coil. Now the wire round resistor is made by physically winding, you know, you know, appreciably large nichrome wire around a former to have uh, uh, the desired resistance. So that's going to have more pronounced parasitic effects. Same deal, more parasitic. And then if we have leads on our resistor, so like, you know, the, the axial leads of that dumbbell shaped resistor, or uh, if we have, you know, a chip resistor with very short, you know, metal contacts, now those will contribute a series inductance resistance of their own. Normally, you know, there'd be, there would be one on each end, but we can just, you know, because it's in series with the device overall, we just normally lump them together for both. And here we're only going to consider the resistance, forget about the inductance for now. There are leadless resistors, which will have very, very small parasitic series inductance and resistance. So here is a general resistor model. This isn't found in your textbook because your textbook thought it was okay to skip resistors and I don't think it is. So a general resistor is something like this. So we've got our coil right here where we've got the main resistance we're trying to achieve with a series inductance. And then we've got a capacitance, you know, between the start and the end of the coil. And then we've got the series resistance from our leads right here. So R sub S, and then L sub S and C sub P. So for a 100 ohm resistor, you might get a magnitude response that looks like this. So notice the scale here. All the way up to about a gigahertz, uh, this is basically flat at, you know, 100 ohms plus, you know, maybe like two ohms for the, the contacts. And then above that, you know, it's going to dip down, uh, you know, start behaving capacitively. Where the impedance decreases with increasing frequency, and then it'll level back out again. You know, thanks to the inductor helping out. So the inductance starts to dominate after a point, all the way up at you know 100 gigahertz. So resistors are fairly ideal for most range of frequencies we're going to deal with. You know, we we try not to deal with you know physical components up at you know. Uh, beyond a gigahertz anyway. Now, if you have a high value resistor, you know, looking at some old Agilent data sheets, I found this model, which is a high value resistor model. So we'll have the series, uh, you know, resistance and the inductance from the leads uh, coupled with the inductance of the, of the coil. And then we know we'll say at every point, the resistance we're trying to get it has a capacitance in parallel. And we're actually going to see the same model being used later with the, uh, an actual capacitor model, but they'll just be different values. So here we say we're going to stick around, you know, the 102 ohms or so of the 100 ohm resistor up until about a gigahertz. And then around a gigahertz, it dips down, reaches a resonance between the LS and CP sub P, and then it shoots up again. So it goes from being heavy resistively to capacitively to bottoming out to RS and then behaving inductively. But notice this is again is that fairly high frequency, so it doesn't uh, affect most things, you know, to our, you know, it's not usually the dominant cause of high frequency effects. Inductors and capacitors usually are. So this really only comes into a play when you're considering extended effects or you just have a mostly resistive circuit and you're trying to figure out what happens at very high frequency. Now, these two models look very different. You know, they differ in where the inductance is located. However, they actually behave quite similarly. They basically say we get a very flat magnitude response and then there's a big dip that comes first. Really flat magnitude response and then there's a big dip. It's what happens after the dip that the two models disagree on. So, you know, maybe this 100 ohms isn't the best value, you know, considered a high value resistor. But, you know, if we're dealing with, say, you know, a 100 kilo ohm resistor, this might be a more accurate model. I just wanted to show you something similar with similar values to see how they behave differently. 
Questions about resistors? I should have done a poll, which is what's your favorite type of linear component, resistors, inductors, or capacitors? Never did that poll. Resistor. A lot of resistor fans in here. Is it just because it's easier? Rest of them are a lot of math. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm a fan of capacitors, though that's not, I, you know, I'm, I would say, you know, you know, resistors are my friend. I'm a fan of capacitors. I'm an ally to inductors. You know, I try to treat them, you know, all positively, but, you know, I like all of them. You enjoy op amps. Okay. That's a good answer, too. Got to have some levity in these conversations. So let's talk about inductors next. So let's talk about a, how you would make a physical inductor you could buy. So the major inductor cores are air cores, ferromagnetic cores, and ferrite cores. So air cores, as the name applies, you know, they're going to be linear because they are just have air in the middle. Air behaves as a linear material. Ferromagnetic cores, if you remember what they talk about briefly in an electromagnetics course or in physics 272, you know that most ferromagnetic materials are nonlinear. So that's not good. Ferrite materials are nonlinear too, but they stay linear up until higher frequencies. So you use ferromagnetic cores when you need high inductance and ferrite cores when you need uh, high frequency, you know, high frequency applications. Air cores are used when you need, when you can get by with low inductances and want linear behavior. So what you're doing is you're wrapping a length of wire around a center core, uh, usually with the help of a bobbin. And then the length of the wire used in the winding leads to a parasitic series resistance. Obviously, if you have a long wire, you would expect there to be a resistance involved in addition to the inductance of the coil. So the series resistance is the most important parasitic. Now the separation of one turn of metal by another turn to another turn of metal through the dielectric of air leads to an inner turn shunt capacitance. And then whenever you have, you know, ferromagnetic and ferrite cores, you'll have core losses in magnetic material, which have energy dissipation modeled by a shunt resistance. I guess you could technically say air breakdown is in there as well, but like core losses are definitely the dominant thing at play. So you actually have energy loss due to the fact that these are nonlinear materials with hysteresis and they behave all sorts of weird compared to what we would like. And that leads inductors to be the least ideal of the three linear two terminal devices. But you know, they're an unfortunate target of you know hate by electrical engineers. People just really hate working with inductors and that's a shame because inductors have a lot of useful properties like magnetic energy storage. So uh, this last point is is too revelatory to, to say for now. I'll show you the realistic model of our inductor. So we'll have our inductance with the series resistance from you know a long length of wire. We'll have the parallel capacitance, you know, inner turn, and we'll have our uh, parallel resistance as well. So expect a big value for the parallel resistance, small value for the shunt for the series resistance. This looks familiar to like problem five on homework five. So here's what happens. So at very low frequencies, you know, the series resistance prevents the inductance from, you know, the inductive or the overall impedance from going lower than the, the resistance. So even though this may have a very low impedance, the series resistance is very small and it dominates. So we go from behaving resistively to behaving inductively, where the magnitude or impedance increases with frequency. You know, magnitude of J omega L says we'll get a positive slope here on log log space. And then we'll get a resonant peak between L and C sub P, where the maximum value of the, I guess, anti-resonant peak is limited by R sub P. And then it behaves capacitively over here 
where CCP dominates. Which brings us to the most mind blowing fact that, you know, this course can probably have the parallel RLC nature, you know, RLC, RLC nature of the real inductor model means that an inductor behaves like a capacitor at high frequencies. So at high frequencies, an inductor becomes a capacitor. What can we think is true anymore in this world? However, this model is a little bit too complicated to deal with in some cases. You know, I like dealing with the full model, but you know, R's and L's and C's, it's a full second order circuit on its own. We can reduce it to a first order circuit by just considering the series resistance and ignoring the core losses and the inner turn capacitance. So we'll just get, yeah, VL is the total voltage across here, and then IL is just the current through the L and RS. So this will be good up until about, you know, 10 to the seventh or so radians per second. Questions? Okay, not ideal capacitor. So the major capacitor dielectrics are plastic film. You know, there's a whole bunch of capacitor technologies out there, but we'll just deal with a few major ones. So there's plastic film, ceramic, uh, which usually uses like niobium dioxide or uh, titanium di trioxide or something like that. And then aluminum electrolytic capacitors and tantalum electrolytic capacitors. So there's an energy loss in the dielectric from causing a static separation of charge between the plates. So we'll have positive and negative charge. There is some charge, you know, some current allowed to flow between the two plates directly. Uh, and, you know, there's energy loss from charging and discharging them. So that produces a parasitic parallel resistance. Uh, the book calls it the most important parasitic. I disagree with that, but for duality's sake, you know, we'll find that, you know, having a series resist or a parallel res or a parallel resistance with the capacitor and a series resistance for the inductor makes life just a little bit easier. So for the sake of duality, I will say that it's the most important parasitic. Uh, the leads of the capacitor contribute a series resistance and a series inductance, normally lumped together for both. And it's important to note that the best electrolytic capacitors, so like the aluminum cans or the sort of like yellow and orange tantalum capacitors are gonna be less ideal than ceramic or film ones. So these tend to have larger series resistances and are lossier dielectrics. So they have little smaller parallel resistances. So here's our realistic capacitor model. So we'll have our main capacitor dielectric loss with RP right here. Then we'll have series resistance L sub S and R sub S, where I is the total current flowing through this whole thing and V sub C is the total voltage across it. If we look at the magnitude response, we would have to go way, way down in frequency, like below 10 to the minus one radian per second to have R sub P become dominant, where you know it's cutting off, it's flattening out the magnitude response there. So I really don't think it's that important of a parasitic because it happens at such a low frequency that no one really bothers with it. But then it behaves capacitively with decreasing frequency with, or decreasing ma impedance magnitude with increasing frequency. Uh, it resonates between the C and L sub S, uh, you know, right before 10 to the seventh radians per second, where it bottoms out at the 0.01 ohms that is set by RS in this example. And then after that, it behaves inductively, which leads to our second mind-blowing statement of the day, the series RLC nature of a real capacitor means that a capacitor behaves like an inductor at high frequency. So past this point, it behaves like an inductor. And like that's mind-blowing. What can we believe is true anymore? Is this inductors become capacitors and capacitors become inductors? This should, this should be like groundbreaking and like earth shattering for so many of you. And then of course our simplified bottle is just the capacitance and the parallel resistance. If we ignore the effect of the leads.
the rule is that, you know, it dominates at low frequencies. So if you're sufficiently below the resonance point, you know, R, RS is what's causing this flattening out down here and L causes this rise up here. So with just L and RS, you get the sort of first order behavior shown here in the magnitude response. But after, once you get close to the resonance point, you really need the C sub P and R sub P to help set things out. And for the capacitor model, R sub P and C dictate this first downward descent to the magnitude response. You know, R sub S and L help set this resonance point. So it's just, when can it be ignored? When you're dealing with frequencies lower than the first resonance or anti-resonance of your, of your real component. Any other questions? Is everyone in shook <laughs> or is everyone in a state of being shook? I, I was shook when I learned this. I'll assume that's why there are more questions. So real talk, you know, if you ever in an argument with a chemical engineering or material science and engineering friend, why is electrical engineering so much more accessible to people than materials and chemicals are? And, you know, I thought about that. And then we just talked about what these, you know, components are made out of. Now, obviously mechanical engineering is probably the most accessible out of any major, it's very tangible and you can get materials and you can start making levers and simple machines and, uh, you know, working with fluids is as simple as having, turning on the tap at, at your faucet, like mechanical engineering is accessible. Electrical engineering is fairly accessible. And it took me a reason to figure out why, and uh, here's why. So think about what resistors are made out of. One type of technology, a common technology is carbon film. Carbon is the fourth most abundant element in the universe and is the basis of all known life. Inductors. Inductors are made of ferromagnetic material, ferro meaning iron. So you can use an iron core inductor. And that's the sixth most abundant element in the universe, made in the core of a dying star. It's the first most common element in the whole of Earth, Earth though it's locked in the core for the most part. Most of the iron on Earth is locked in the inner and outer core, but it is still the fourth most abundant element in the crust of the Earth. Capacitors are made out of aluminum electrolytic material. Aluminum is the eighth most abundant element on the whole Earth, and it's the third most abundant element in Earth's crust. Uh, transmission lines are made out of copper, so you get really good conductors made out of copper. Uh, it's the, only the 26th most uh, abundant element in Earth's crust. It's why when thieves break into power plant substations, they steal the copper. They don't bother stealing the iron out of transformers or the electrolytic fluid out of capacitors. It's too common. You know, copper is valuable. And then, you know, diodes and transistors are made out of silicon, which is the eighth most abundant element in the universe, made in really large stars. Uh, it's the third most abundant element on the whole of Earth and the second most abundant element in the crust. Literally, diodes and transistors are made out of sand. Like, that's how easy it is to come across this material. So, why is electrical engineering so accessible? It's not because we use the rarest or most exotic elements. It's because we use the most common elements in the universe, or at least in Earth's crust. That's why it's accessible. If you really want to know what's going to, you know, make batteries and like the electric revolution happen, uh, we need to switch away from lithium ions, which are very hard to come by for our batteries, uh, and see if we can make like a sodium ion or a potassium ion battery, or, you know, maybe magnesium or uh, calcium, because those are very common elements. And then chemical engineering would be a lot more accessible, at least in terms of batteries and battery storage. Uh, it would make everything cheaper and you can make them pretty much anywhere in the world. 
but yeah, you can make a resistor just uh, with, you know, pencil lead, uh, you know, which is actually carbon, graphite, you know, iron is found everywhere. You can make an inductor with it. And, you know, with the right, you know, chemical handling, you can make a capacitor out of aluminum and process sand into diodes and transistors. Like, that's why electrical engineering is so accessible. Uh, vibradium would be the opposite of accessible because it's a frictional metal. I don't know. I just thought that was uh, an interesting thought that I had one day. So because we have these RLC bandpass characteristics for the real capacitor and real inductor, we can borrow some of the language we used when talking about bandpass circuits. So, you know, we can talk about bandwidth and quality factor and center frequency. So center frequency is just the resonant frequency, which is something you might be able to find on a data sheet or at least graphed uh, like we did for the magnitude response. But we can define an element quality factor Q sub Z as the ratio of reactance to resistance in magnitude as a function of the radial frequency. So X J omega over R J omega. And but an ideal reactive component purely stores energy with no loss. So if we had absolutely no loss, there'd be no resistance to our reactive component. So Q sub Z would go to infinity. By default, when we talk about the element quality factor, we are assumed to be evaluating with omega equals omega naught, uh, or at the very least, omega r, which is uh, the resonant frequency right here, you know, or the anti-resonant frequency right here. However, the presence of parasitic elements means that the natural frequency is not always one over square root LC as we might suppose. So it gets a little bit more complicated. Um, shucks, we have to actually deal with, you know, what it means to have a natural frequency when we're building circuits with non-ideal elements that have their own L's and C's in them and R's as well. So we'll define the element quality factor for an inductor as a function of omega to be omega L over R sub S. And then this is where I think the book has a mistake. I think the book has this the, uh, unreciprocated. The element quality factor for a capacitor is one over omega R P sub P times C. So if the book is wrong, or let's see, if this equation is right, then that means this equation is right. If the book is right with this equation is actually unreciprocated, then that means this equation is wrong. <laughs> so there's some inconsistency in your book. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure which is which, but I thought it through and I think this makes the most sense. So you know, I'll just make a note. Book is wrong about at least one thing. So what happens if we try to build a parallel RLC with our simplified models? So we'll let the re resistance be an ideal resistance and we'll use our simplified inductor model and our simplified capacitor model. So our parallel RLC circuit would say, okay, we've got you know some definite equivalent of our source V in and R S and then we'll have an R here. And then our inductance is, uh, L in series with little r sub L, and then our capacitance is C in parallel with little r sub C. So overall, if you were to combine the resistances, note at this capacitance here, this is basically like, looks like a version of just the real inductor model. And then over here, uh, we can say the dual thing right here, where we have our theremin equivalent source with Vn and R sub S. And then we feed into an output resistance where we, our load resistance where we measure the output, which is R. And 
And then we'll have our inductor with L and little r sub L in series. And then we'll have our capacitor with C and little r sub C in parallel. And you notice this looks like, you know, a series R, a series L, and then C uh, in parallel with the resistance. This basically looks like the complete capacitor model uh, itself as a series RLC circuit. So there's a, some sort of self-similarity between the larger circuit and what the element itself looks like. Now, it's possible to analyze the effective, you know, you know, parallel series uh, circuit right here or the series parallel circuit right here. Uh, exactly. But, you know, sometimes you want a quicker answer than that. And it would be a pain to do this on an exam without computer tools. So we're going to use an approximate solution through a process that I call single frequency impedance conversion. It's possible to represent and convert a series in parallel. the series and parallel elements as parallel or series elements, so vice versa, valid at a single frequency only. I, I have an extra word, like we don't need to have to represent in here. It's possible to convert a series element into parallel ones or a parallel element into series ones, valid at a single frequency only. We just need the series to parallel impedance conversion to reduce this parallel RLC model to purely parallel elements. So we need to convert this inductance in series with a resistance into parallel elements. And then for this one, we need to convert the capacitance and parallel resistance into purely series elements. And that would be a lot easier to analyze. You know, we like the purely parallel and purely series RLC circuits. They're not what I give you on exams. So here's how we do parallel to series conversion. So we have R and J X of S, and then in the parallel will be G sub P in parallel with J B sub P, where R is the resistance, X of S is the series reactance, G sub P is the conductance, B sub P is the parallel at uh, susceptance. So we want the parallel impedance to be the exact same as the series impedance caused by actual components. So we make the following choices for G sub P and B sub P. So one over Z is one over R plus J X sub S. We can multiply top and bottom by R minus J X sub S and get R sub S over R sub S squared plus X sub S squared minus J X sub S over R sub S plus X sub S squared. So that means if we're going from series to parallel, we're gonna choose a, a parallel, a, uh, conductance, that's equivalent to RS over RS squared plus X of S squared. And we're going to choose our uh, susceptance to be negative X of S over R sub S squared plus X of S squared. Notice that, you know, X of S is usually at the form, you know, like omega L. X of S depends on omega. We only have enough degrees of freedom to specify G sub P and B sub P for a single frequency. Because this is the function of frequency, this is only a single frequency impedance conversion instead of a multi-frequency impedance conversion. And the dual statement to parallel to series right here. So we'll have, you know, conductance plus parallel susceptance. Impedance is resistance plus series uh, reactance. Uh, one over Y is one over G sub P plus J B sub P uh, multiplied by the complex conjugate top and bottom. And you get this right here. And you want the series admittance to be equal to the parallel uh, admittance caused by actual components. So we'll say R sub S is going to be equal to G sub P over G sub P squared plus B sub P squared. And X sub S is equal to negative B sub P over G sub P plus B sub P squared. And because B sub P is usually a form like omega C, we only have enough degrees of freedom to specify R sub S and X sub S for a single frequency because V sub P appears in the denominator of both. So this is only a single frequency 
conversion of parallel elements, elements into series impedance elements. What questions do we have? Well, we say any impedance that, you know, has like a series resistance and, you know, series susceptance or reactance can be transformed at a single frequency and vice versa. Anything that's a conductance in a single susceptance can be transformed at a single frequency. So we can always do it. Tanyan, we're going to choose the one that reduces this to basically something that appears all in parallel because everything else is in parallel. And we can always do source transformation to make this a current source with a parallel resistance. And this one, everything is clearly in series except for these two things. So we want to turn these parallel admittance elements into series impedance elements. That's how we would choose the onion. You're welcome. Any more questions? If not, my advice, you know, start homework seven early so that you can finish it and be more prepared for the exam. Uh, you know, you definitely want to prepare for the final exam when you can. Uh, I'll be available uh, through Zoom for office hours today. Hope to see some of you there. Goodbye, everyone. That's it for lecture today. Yeah, should have the solution for exam two out by Friday. Goodbye, you're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye, Ali. -bye. Bye,